All right, we can go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you all for attending Team ACOG's Water and Wastewater Operator Training in this new web-based format. I'm Kari Gerwin, the Director of Water Quality Planning here at Team ACOG. And today I'm joined by uh, two other water quality staff, Barbie Kalta and Matt Kennedy. Barbie and Matt will be administering the polls and taking questions for the speakers. I'd like to give a big thanks also to Join Jones and Henry uh, engineers for their sponsorship of this year's webinar series and to our presenters for their time in preparing this valuable training. Now, before we get started, I'd like to provide you all with a short overview of this webinar format. Uh, you will all be muted, but we encourage you to participate in the discussion using the questions function. Now, our uh, presenters are ready to take your questions today and we will be addressing your questions uh, during some pauses in the presentation and then following each presentation. So um, please, any questions you have for our presenters, uh, send them our way using the question function. And you can find this in your toolbar as noted on your screen. Now, um, any questions that we don't get to during the webinar, we will address following, following the webinar via email. You will also be asked to participate in a total of six polls during this webinar. It's important that you participate in these polls because they help our presenters to get to know you and they also count toward your webinar participation score. So we'll talk more on this particip participation score in just a moment. You will also be asked to participate in a survey at the end of the webinar. This is also a mandatory component of your participation score. Now, we'd like to give you a feel for how these polls work. So Barbie will be launching a test poll in a moment. Uh, so you'll have an opportunity to try this out and um, work through the polling function so that when the actual polls are, are launched in a few minutes here, um, you'll be able to participate in those. So Barbie, you can go ahead and launch that first poll. So this is just an example of what you'll be seeing. So if everyone could please go ahead and participate in your on this poll, let us know which of the following best describes best describes your job title. Are you a water operator, a wastewater operator, professional engineer, or another um, in another position? And typically these take a few minutes to complete. Um, our goal is to get these done as quickly as possible so that we can get through to the meat of our presentation. So um, if everyone could please participate in that poll, uh, we can close it out and keep moving forward. And Barbie, how many folks do we have participating in that poll? We have about 85% who have voted so far, so. Give it a few more seconds. So we are using these polls to um, help track attendance and uh, participation in this webinar. Uh, for those of you who are registered um, wastewater or water operators, you'll know that Ohio EPA uh, does require some additional um, verification of your attendance. So this is how we are um, verifying your attendance. Okay, can we close that poll out? All right, and it looks like we've got, um, and I can't actually read the numbers on my screen, but it looks like we've got quite a few wastewater and water operators on the, on the webinar today. So thank you all for joining us. All right, with that, we can go ahead and move forward. So um, as you know, today's webinar has been approved by Ohio EPA for contact hours. Today's webinar is approved for 1.5 contact hours. In order to provide these operator contact hours, Ohio EPA requires us to monitor attendance and participation. Um, as I mentioned at the, the beginning of the webinar, um, before we got started, each of you um, will need to be logged in uh, separately with your own registration that you um, got to your own separate email address. So if you have multiple operators who are uh, watching from the same computer, um, only that first operator will get the credits. So um, we ask you now if this is the case and you want all of your operators to get those credits, 
please uh, just submit an email address to the question box and we will send you a separate registration for each of the attendees. So in order to receive contact hours, you must have the webinar as your active screen for at least 90% of the time during this training event. So this means that you don't have other windows open and in front of it and you're not checking email and browsing the web uh, while the webinar is running. As I mentioned, you must also participate in the GoToWebinar polls. However, I would like to point out that your answers will not be graded for accuracy. So um, don't, don't worry about um, getting the correct answer. We just wanna ensure that, um, that you are participating in those polls. Now, immediately following the webinar and before you log out, you'll be asked to take a mandatory survey. This survey also counts towards your participation score. Um, for those of you who did join us for our first webinar last week, you'll know that that survey actually did not launch following the webinar. So if that would happen again, what we'll do is we'll send you a separate survey via email um, that you can take uh, rather than the, the automatically launched one after the webinar. I'll also point out that any technology issues such as loss of Wi-Fi or any um, disconnection will not change your participation requirements. So we, if you do lose your connection, please do try to reconnect as soon as possible so that your participation score is not impacted. Now with that, we can start getting into our agenda. Um, today's webinar will include two presentations, uh, one by Elizabeth Wick with Ohio EPA and a second by Jason Collins of the Lucas County Water Resources Recovery Facility. Um, between these two presentations, we will take a five minute break, uh, but I would like to let you know that you will still need to remain logged into the webinar and keep the webinar as your active screen during this five minute break. Um, it's just a bit of time to get up and get a drink of water and uh, come back and uh, we'll get right back into the second presentation. So with those announcements out of the way, um, I would like to go ahead and announce our, introduce our first speaker. And we'll get her presentation pulled up here in just a moment. So our first speaker today is Elizabeth Wick with Ohio EPA. She is the manager of the Division of Surface Water in the Northwest District Office of Ohio EPA. She has been with the Division of Surface Water for 33 years. Elizabeth is a registered professional engineer and holds a class three wastewater operator certificate. She has a bachelor's of science degree in chemical engineering from the University of Toledo. Today, Elizabeth will be discussing requirements for operator of record log books. All right, thank you, Kari. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. I, hope everyone can, I hope everyone can hear me okay, since I'm working from home, like maybe not a lot of you, but we are still working. Yep, you from sound home. great. Okay, good. So I want to talk to you today about operator logbooks and why they're important and why you need to keep them. Um, let's see if we get the presentation to respond. <laughs> there it goes. Okay, so why should you keep a logbook? Well, first of all, because they're required by rule and it helps you keep track of what you're doing at the plant and it serves as a method to keep track of your time and make sure that you're hitting your minimum uh, staffing hours and also it's a cya it uh, helps you protect your hard-earned certification and it does help us prove that you are meeting the minimum staffing times And Ohio Administrative Code 3745-7 is our operator certification rules. And that covers both water and wastewater. Uh, it has our record keeping requirements. It has the responsibilities of professional operators. Um, it requires that the owner or operator of record shall maintain operation and maintenance records. And it applies to both water and wastewater. So I'm a wastewater person. I've been a wastewater person for 33 years. So um, I'm trying not to sway too much towards the wastewater, but that's where my expertise is. So, but this does count for both water and wastewater. The first thing I wanted to cover that's in the rules is the duties of a professional operator. 
And that is in the rules, it says that you shall perform your duties in a responsible and professional manner, consistent with standard operating procedures and best management practices. And that the professional operator shall operate and maintain the plants so as not to endanger other workers, the public health, or the environment due to negligence or incompetence. And that the professional operator should report all instances of non-compliance to the operator of record or the facility supervisor. Now that rule also has a separate section that talks about the duties of the professional operator of record. So the previous one was professional operators. These are the extra things that the operator of record must do. In addition to everything that a professional operator shall do. So the operator of record has responsible and effective on-site management and supervision of technical operations of the plant. And is required to immediately immediately notify the permittee or the owner or the regulatory agency of items that are require notification under 6111 or 6109 or your MPDES permit. The operator of record also has to ensure that record keeping requirements are met, that minimum staffing times are met. Uh, something that people miss sometimes is that you're supposed to display a copy of your valid certificate and renewal card at the facility. And the operator of record is also required to report the minimum staffing times to the agency on a form approved by the director, which now we're using um, in surface water, we're using that as your EDMR. Um, we'll have uh, some uh, new things coming here towards the end of my presentation. And now we're ready for the first polling question. All right, here's your first poll. So which item is not a responsibility of the professional operator of record? Perform duties in responsible and professional manner, report all instances of non-compliance, ensure record keeping and staffing times are met, display a copy of a valid certificate and renewal card, or all of these are responsibilities of an ORC. So we'll give you a few minutes to respond to this poll. And while we're waiting for you guys to take the time to be able to fill this out, I wanted to put a question um, to ask, do all the operators have to report their time in and time out? It's the, the operator of record that is required to do the minimum staffing times. So that's the one that we're looking at. Um, the other operators, if they're counting towards that operator of record, should it put their time in and time out. But if they're not counting towards an operator of record for minimum staffing times, Ohio EPA is not requiring you to report your time. All right, we have about 86% of the people voted, so try and get your vote in here as soon as you can. Okay, it looks like, um, according to what I can see, 97% of the people got the correct answer that all of those are responsibilities of the operator of record. That's good. Ohio Administrative Code, uh, the operator certification rules in the section 09 talk about the logbooks. And that's where you can find all the requirements for what should be in a logbook. And the shalls mean they shall. Um, that's attorney talk for you. You have to do this no matter what. Um, so the logbook should be housed and maintained to be protected from the weather. It shall guarantee the authenticity and accuracy of the data. And it shall be accessible on site for 24 hour inspection by the agency or emergency personnel. Uh, here's an example of housed and maintained to be protected from the weather. Uh, you can put a mailbox at the plant. Um, 
on the wastewater side, you know, we have the small package plants that are sometimes out in the middle of nowhere. So we see people just attach the pipe to the fence. We see tucker totes. We see them put in electrical control boxes, um, just somewhere that's secure on the site where they can be looked at if somebody, is, if we are out there or emergency personnel need to be out there. Uh, to guarantee the authenticity and accuracy, uh, it, everything should be written in pen, not pencil. Uh, it should be a bound book with consecutively numbered pages. You can have well-organized computer logs, but we don't want to see any loose pages on a clipboard. We don't want to see three ring binders or spiral notebooks. For computer logs, uh, you have to automatically document the date, the time, and the person making the entry. And it, that system has to be able to prevent deletion of data. Um, you can also get this equivalent method approved by the director to meet the rules. If you have some other way you want to do this, you can certainly submit a request to the agency and it would get reviewed and it would have to go all the way up to the director for her to say, yes, that meets the rule and we're good with it. The minimum information to have on your logbook is the identification of the public water system, the sewerage system, the treatment works has to be on there somewhere. Um, you have to have the date and time of arrival and departure of the operator of record and any other operator required by this chapter that um, that would be like your backup operator if he's serving as the operator of record. You're supposed to include specific operation and maintenance activities, uh, results of tests performed and samples taken. Um, unless those are on a bench sheet, then they can be on a bench sheet. Um, performance of preventive maintenance that has occurred, and then an identification of the person making the entries. These are some examples of um, identifying the facility. Um, the one on the left that has the letter B on it looks like we don't have a name on the cover of that one, but the other two certainly have the name of the facility on the front cover. And Uh, you want to keep track of the date and time of arrival and departure of the operator of record. So you enter the date that you're at the plant, write your initials, enter the time you arrived in military time, enter the time you left in military time. And if you don't document those times, we are going to assume that you're not meeting the minimum staffing times and probably write you a violation letter um, unless you can prove otherwise. <clears throat> Excuse me. And on the initials, it's good to, if uh, you're a contract operating firm and you have several operators, it's good to have a like an acronym key in the front of the book that says EW it is Elizabeth Wick. Um, it would just have KG would be Kari Gerwin, just so that when somebody's looking at that, they know whose initials they're looking at. Here's a couple examples of um, date and time of arrival and departure. You can see that the month, August 2012, and then we've got the time, written in military time. There's some initials to the left of that, circled in red. Uh, down lower, you see another day on the 13th. The time is military, and we've got some initials. So hopefully, in the beginning of this book, we have a key to whose initials those are. Here's an example. Um, there's many things wrong with this example, because it is a spiral notebook, which is not truly um, at, uh, in compliance with the rule. And then you can see the times are written in non-military time. For specific operation and maintenance activities, it's any activity that affects or has the potential to affect the quality or quantity of the sewage conveyed, the effluent produced, the drinking water produced. So those are things that should be written down in the book. So here you can see they clean the upflow filters, they reset a blower, they added chlorine and dechlorination tablets. Those are things that could affect the effluent produced, so they should be written down in the book. And here's another example of specific operation and maintenance activities. Um, they're filling buckets with bicarbonate and adding two thirds of a bucket to the aeration tank because that will affect the effluent produced. 
the results of the test performed and samples taken unless they're documented on a lab sheet. So this example um, may actually have been their logbook at the time, which doesn't work because it's loose sheets on a clipboard. But it's also an example of a bench sheet where the person making the daily visits is marking down the color, odor, turbidity, the temperature, the um, pump time, run times, and then they would transfer that information potentially to the logbook if they needed to, but um, it's just kept here for their daily visits. Here's an example of um, preventive maintenance. And again, it's written down. This would be a logbook violation if you were using this as your log as your logbook because it's loose leaf paper on a um, clipboard. But you can see they did put specific preventive maintenance in there where they wasted sludge, they unplugged some diffusers, unplugged some returns. So those are preventive maintenance examples that should be written down. Here's another example of keeping track of preventive maintenance. If you switched blowers or switched sand beds, replaced belts, those are all preventive maintenance. Uh, here's some examples of the names of the initials. And um, like I said before, it's good to have a key to the initials in the front of the book. But other requirements for the logbook is that it be kept up to date, that it contain a minimum of the previous three months of data at all times, and that you maintain those for at least three years. You also, um, have to keep in mind that the rule, requir the rule requires visits to all treatment works five days a week. So the operator of record may only have to be there for four hours a week or 40 hours a week. Well, 40 wouldn't work, but if the operator of record only has to be there a certain amount of hours, somebody needs to visit that plant every day. And that could be, if it's a mobile home park you're operating, it could be the manager at the mobile home park has to go to the plant and just check on things, make sure things are running. And those should be documented in a logbook that they visited, um, just so that we can say, yes, yeah, somebody is making daily visits to this plant as required. Uh, here's an example of the daily visit sheet that somebody was keeping, but um, this was being used as a logbook and uh, routine visit does not work as a good example of preventive maintenance. Uh, the times are not written in military time. So uh, there's no initials in the right-hand column of who did it. We see the dates, but we don't know who did it. So um, this was written up as a logbook violation. Here's another, um, this was the example of the bench sheet where they're just documenting their daily visits. And um, that can be, I guess they can be in a different book if the operator of record wants to keep his own book and then you have a daily visit book, that, that would work also. Uh, here's an example again of um, logbook violations we found because this has the date and no initials, or maybe that yeah, there are some initials there, um, but no timeout. So the person got to the plant but evidently never left. Here's an example of a problem logbook because it doesn't have it doesn't have an identification for what facility it is for. Um, this one we highlighted. It's uh, another kind of a bad example. There's no times on this one, and then uh, raking and applying weed killer to filters. Ohio EPA does not recommend that you put weed killer on sand filters. I know it's done, but it's not something we would recommend that you do. Um, but there are no times on this one. Nor do we really know what month we're in unless it's written at the top and cut off here. Uh, this one I highlighted because this operator actually said admitted week second and third, we missed the visits. And that's an important thing to note that if you don't make it some to a visit, document that in the logbook that you didn't visit just so that um, it's covered. It's good to admit when you miss it. 
So now we're ready for our second polling question. All right, here's the second poll. So your operator logbook must contain specific operation and maintenance activities, be accessible with the operator at all times, be written in ink and bound with numbered pages, identify the public water system or treatment works, or contain the date and time of arrival and departure of ORC. So take a couple minutes and answer this poll. While we're waiting for that, I'll post, uh, I'll say another question. On the new application, do I have to log in there every day or can I put all the times in one time each month? Uh, we'll get to that at the, uh, I think it's coming up next. Um, but for the new Operator Hour app, you can either do it every day or you could do it just at the end of the month before you submit it. But we will cover that here in a little bit. The thing to keep in mind with the app is you can um, only submit it. I have to remember. You can only submit it twice. You can change. You can save it several times, but you can only submit it one time. Resubmit maybe a, a second time, and that's it. Oh, Elizabeth, I've got a question about this um, polling question. Is there only one correct answer here? Because I'm, no, I'm looking at these. I was looking at that too, saying it probably should be select all that apply, but I don't know if it allows you to select more than one. But No, I think we must have entered this question incorrectly. So for those of you who are kind of stumped on which the correct answer is, just go ahead and choose one, because I have a feeling that there might be more than one correct answer. Yes. And again, you're not being graded on these. And Barbie, how many folks are we still waiting on? Uh, we're at a 91%, so I'll just give it a few more seconds and close it. Elizabeth, I have another question for you. Um, when, when you're out on site and doing inspection and uh, looking at record keeping. I, I noticed that you showed some uh, bench sheets and these daily visit books. Are you inspecting those as well or are you only looking at the log books? Uh, it depends on the size of the plant. If we're at a large plant and we're in the lab, sometimes we look at the bench sheets. Um, most of the smaller, what we call the package plants, don't really have bench sheets. It's all in the log book. So we're but you really, um, the emphasis is on the log books. Okay. So it looks like um, for our poll results that um, the, the wrong answer was be accessible with the operator at all times because it's supposed to be um, at on site at all times. And so that is sometimes a problem when you're a contract operator that renders several plants and you keep the books in your truck. Um, they really should be on site, not with the operator. But all the other the other three, four answers, I'm sorry, I can count. The other four answers are uh, supposed to be in the logbook. Okay. So uh, the consequences of not keeping a logbook because we will conduct logbook aud audits when we're out there. Um, that we would note things as violations, and we may include that in a follow-up letter. Um, depending how many problems there are, you might get a separate NOV for um, not having your initials, not having time. Um, things we notice are, we'll take pictures while we're out there. If we run around to a couple plants with you, we'll take pictures. We get back to the office and we compare and we find out that this book says you were at plant A from one to three, but this book says you were at plant B from one to three then um, you're going to get a violation letter for being at two places at the same time. Um, if you don't really have a good description of your operation and maintenance, <clears throat> that could also um, 
result in an NOV, but I don't know us to write an NOV for that. We would pretty much probably just say, you know, you should put more detail in your book. Um, if you don't have a logbook at all, you're going to get a violation letter. And if you're not meeting minimum staffing times, we will definitely give you an NOV for that. Uh, things that could be considered criminal is um, obviously lying about your time or falsifying data. Um, we have done a few criminal actions for those kind of things. And um, it's not done by my staff, it's done by separate criminal investigators, but um, it does happen. Um, we have we have revoked licenses. Um, if you have civil violations, we're just going to write an NOV or do follow-up inspections. Depending how egregious it is, we might do a referral. Um, you could maybe get your license suspended through a civil, but if you have criminal violations, um, you will probably get your certification revoked. Um, you may get jail time. I I think we've had one in my career, maybe that got jail time, but um, you definitely will get your certification revoked. Uh, this was related to one of the questions. Um, we have a new app out there, and I think that it's out for full use by everybody now for minimum staffing time reporting. It's in the eBusiness Center, which is where you submit your monthly reports. And you just look on the home page, you'll see something called certified operator minimum staffing. And you can go in and add the facilities that you're required to report your time for by searching either under the NPDES permit number or searching under the public uh, water supply ID. And you can then go in and report your time. So drinking water facilities show up as the water plant or the distribution system and wastewater facilities and collection systems all get reported under the same MPDS number. So on drinking water, you have two separate, but in wastewater, you have just one under the permit number. So this is the home page of the eBusiness Center. You can see there that the certified operator minimum staffing reporting is there. You would just click on that to get into it. And um, as long as you have an eBusiness Center pin and an appropriate certification, then you can be added to your facility. So, and you add the operator just simply by clicking when you get into there on a search button and you can search yourself by core person ID, your eBiz user ID, your last name or your first name. And as long as you have the proper certification for that facility, you'll show, you'll show up on a list. You can select yourself or somebody else can select you in the city and um, put you on as the operator of record. This will eventually replace the operator of record form because you can go in and add operators and remove operators. Um, they just have it so that if you're a water system, you can't pick a wastewater operator to run the water system. So once you get yourself submitted, then an email comes out to Ohio EPA, the, whichever division it's under, and they review it in Columbus, will review and make sure that person has the proper certification and they will approve the operator. And then the operator gets notified that they have to go in and activate the service. So the operator will get an email. He'll have to log into the eBusiness Center and get to his place, click on activate, answer his security question, put in his PIN, and then you can start reporting your times in this app. And you don't have to report that on your eDMRs once you're using this app. And the timesheets in there have space for up to eight operators. So if you have ORCs that switch throughout the day because someone's gone, you can still cover up to eight operators in there. So here's an example of what the uh, sheet would look like if you're adding staffing times for your facility. You can see you um, have the date, you select your operator of record, you put in the start time, the end time, you can, if the same day there's another operator record that covers, you can put it, select them, put in start time and end time. And the total hours will add up over here on the left. And once you hit the total hours, then um, you can submit. So they say that each operator should enter their own time, but at the end of the month, there should be one operator that submits the final report to the agency. 
and they said there's 5,000 facilities in there that are ready for, to be added. So you can start using this now. So a few conclusions here that um, this is your livelihood and we're all professionals that are in the business. And I have a lot of respect for all of you because you've been working hard these past 16 weeks that we've been in chaos and uh, keeping things running and we really do appreciate that at the agency and really it's better to miss a visit than lie about your visit that just what i would recommend is just say oh i missed it then oh yeah i was there and forgot to write it down um, we have revoked certifications that's not fun to do when that's your livelihood and um, despite what people think we really do try to make your job easier at ohio epa i know sometimes even i feel like we're not trying to make your job easier but um, I think we really, in the long run, we are. And this app should help with that. That should really help with the time recording. With that, I think we have another question. All right. Which of the following are considered blog book violations? No time recorded, being at two plants at the same time, insufficient description of O and M, or all of these are violations? I've got another question while we're waiting for this one. Okay. Um, will the inspectors look at the logbook during every inspection? Hmm. That's a tough one to answer. I wanna say yes, they will, but um, what they actually do when they're out in the field, um, you know, that can vary by inspector sometimes. We tell them they should do that, but um, I don't know for sure. I can't say 100% of the time they do on the wastewater side. Um, hard to answer for water side for me, but on the wastewater side, we tell them to look at the logbooks. They may not take pictures of them every time, but they usually glance through them. All right, a few more seconds and we'll close the poll. Well, okay. ah, very good, see, everybody paid attention. 100% got the question correct, so thank you, that's good. <laughs> no excuses now, right? Um, I was gonna say something about the app, but I forget what it was, it's gone. Um, does anybody have any other questions for me? Um, on this slide now, you can see um, my contact information and um, the approval number for this um, presentation. I will say, and I really have no idea who is on listening to us since I can't see the attendance list, but um, I do plan on retiring coming up very shortly. So. Um, this contact information will work till the end of August. And then um, I would recommend if you have questions on something like this, you call Tom Poffenbarger of our office. Um, as the, he's the compliance supervisor, so he would be able to help you through things. Well, Elizabeth, congratulations on your yeah. <laughs> upcoming retirement. That's exciting. Yeah, how's um, that for an announcement during a webinar? <laughs> <laughs> Heard it here first, folks. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I know we've uh, probably got a few questions in the queue. Um, I was going to uh, throw one out, though. Um, you would mentioned consequences and notices of violation. Um, are those issued only to the operator of record, or are those, those notices of violation issued to the, um, the treatment plant itself? Um, if there's several but like if there's violations of effluent limits and um uh, just general lack of maintenance at a plant the letter would go to the facility owner um, the permittee uh, we always copy the operator like at a package plant we'll always copy the operator on the violation letter if the violations are all related to just the logbook and operator operator issues then we have issued NOVs directly to the operator also, and then copied the permittee on that letter. 
Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Matt, do we have some more questions from folks on the line? We do, and I'll kind of work through these as they came in. So the first question will be, um, will operators be required to use the app? I'm going to say no, they're not required right now, but I think in the future it will probably be a requirement because it's a much easier way to keep track of your hours and we're not putting those in the EDMR anymore. And we're not putting that that um, outfall, I'll call it, in the NPDES permits. But I think eventually it will be a required way to report your hours. Another question is, why can you not use a spiral bound dated logbook such as a planner? Um, and also you, where sheets cannot be added or removed and dates are already provided. I think when you, I, they say they don't want them bound, like, I mean, they don't want them spiral because you can pull pages out and add them. But really if it's like that spiral calendar we saw, that one, if you pulled a page out, it would be obvious that it was pulled out. Um, but that's was what the interpretation was when the rule came out was that they had to be bound and couldn't be spiral notebooks or three ring binders. The three ring binders are obvious because you could add and remove pages. Um, the spiral one is a little tougher in my mind. That one might be okay. This one is a little bit of a longer one and a little bit more technical, but according to section 3745-7-03, it talks about how a professional operator of record shall at a minimum be physically present at the public water system and fulfill the time requirements as detailed in table two and perform technical operation as assigned by the owner of a public water system or their uh, designee. Time spent working on equipment within the service area of a public water system as part of professional operator of records normal job responsibilities shall count towards the minimum staffing time requirements. So the question is, so if you are at ORC and need to go down to the city building for a meeting about something such as personnel or budget, do I need to sign out? I'm still in the public water system and I'm performing duties assigned by the designated owner. Yeah. Um. According to Columbus, our central office people, if you're going to a meeting downtown and leaving the facility, it doesn't count as your staffing time that you have to sign out. Um, there's, uh, water is a little different from wastewater on that, but I think wastewater also says that in Columbus. Um, yeah. So the answer to that is it, I guess it doesn't count when you go downtown for a meeting which we should comment on, or people should comment on when the rule comes out for uh, review, that you're still doing stuff related to the facility when you're at a meeting downtown, especially if you're there for a budget meeting or a meeting with an engineer. So um, might be worth commenting on that someday when the rules are draft again. Thank you. And I have another mm -hmm. one. Um, someone noticed that the app cannot be used if you have received a reduction in staffing. Why is that the case? Yeah, they said that in Columbus that it can't be used if you have a staffing hour reduction. And I don't know why that is because you would think that in the programming they'd be able to account for that. But right now, it, yeah, if you have a reduction in hours, the app doesn't work. Um, we can. I can try to get clarification on that from uh, Columbus and see why that is. And another question related to the app, do you need to use the app to put in staffing times now or can you use EDMR? Uh, right now you can still use EDMR. Um, the app is not required yet. It might be someday. Another question was asking about before you retire, any chance you'd be able to present on laboratory inspections? <laughs> That's funny. Um, possibly. I think so. 
And Elizabeth, um, if you're willing to do that, uh, we do have this web-based uh, platform that we can uh, put together another webinar. So if there's enough interest and if you're willing, uh, we can certainly help to facilitate that. Okay. Yeah, now that I've done my first webinar, maybe I can do another one. <laughs> <laughs> another question would be, can you speak about logbook requirements for collection systems or water distribution systems only? Um, I the, the collection system side, you have to make visits um, I don't think that we have logbook requirements for collections right now. Um, it's just saying that logging that you made a visit in your time sheets, which you can on the surface water side on the um, app, you put in your collection system visits as well as your plant operator record visits. Um, I don't know about water distribution, but um, we can certainly check with Mike Deal on that. And going along with that, what counts as a visit to a collection system? That's a really good question. We've asked that one too. Um, really, it's just checking a, pump and, checking a pump station because there isn't a time requirement on the collection side, it's just a visit. So it's checking a pump station, um, looking at CSO outfalls, it's just being out at the collection system. There hasn't been real clarification on that. At least there's no time requirement on that right now. And do you have to log out if you are sampling at an industry? Hmm. I guess in theory, you're not at the plant. So Columbus would probably say you do. Um, in my mind, you're you're still performing work for the treatment plant, so um, I would interpret that as you're still working, but technically you're not at the plant, so you probably should. It doesn't make a lot of sense in my mind. <laughs> And considering we're working on getting operator hour or operator contact hours through this type of course, do you have any other resources where um, operator contact hours can be received? Um, I think Ohio Water Environment Association is working on some online things also. Um, I know there's some workshops coming up in July. And I, that's all I'm aware of right now, mostly through Water Environment and WAF. And I will also add to that. Um, first, when we uh, find those, uh, I'm going to do a little search and find those webinars that Elizabeth just pointed to, um, and we'll uh, get those out to all of our attendees today. Um, but if there are other topics that you would uh, like to hear about um, where you can um, apply for some O&M hours, please just uh, let me or any Team of COG staff know. And um, like I said, we're willing to put together additional webinars if there's enough interest in certain topics. So uh, please just let us know through email and we'll see what we can do um, this year to, to host some more trainings. And uh, with that, I'll let Matt get back to the last uh, question. Or, I know we probably have time for one more question, Matt. All right, so one more question. How many notice of violation letters would you get before referral? Is that maybe one or two or kind of what's, <laughs> what's the process in terms of you know, once you receive a violation letter kind of what do you do from there? Um, the best thing when you get a violation letter is to respond within the 30 days that it says to respond within. If you do that, um, then you'll avoid any further problems. Um, best way to get a referral is to not respond to the NOV and get a second NOV and not respond to that NOV. And then we probably work towards a referral. Um, it's hard to say if it's two or three NOVs because it really depends on the case and the situation. But um, even if you have to respond within 30 days that, oh yeah, I'm, I'm gonna work on that and you know I'll get this 
going here in the next two weeks, that's better than not responding at all. All right. Well, thank you, Elizabeth, for the fantastic presentation and for taking time to answer all of those questions. Um, Matt, do we still have additional questions that we'll need to follow up through email? Nope. That's what I was just about to say is that we got through all of the questions that we had uh, posed to us. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. All, all right. right. Thank well, you. again, Elizabeth, thank you so very much. This was a, a great discussion and um, everyone's got your email address and I'm sure they'll follow up with you if they have any additional questions. All right, that'd be great. Thank you, everyone. And with that, we are at our five minute break. So um, actually it looks like it'll be about four minutes now. So if you'd like to uh, take a few minutes, uh, we will uh, resume at 11 o'clock sharp. See you then.
All right, everyone, welcome back. It's 11 o'clock and we will uh, jump right into our next presentation. Um, I, I've decided that if you uh, join another webinar, we should probably have some nice background music playing during the break. So stay tuned. Next time we might uh, we might have some music. Um, but I would like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Jason Collins. Uh, Jason Collins is the facility manager at the Lucas County Water Resources Recovery Facility. He's a 1991 graduate of Anthony Wayne High School in White House, Ohio, and graduated from Owens Community College in 2003 with an associate's degree in environmental management. Jason holds an Ohio EPA Class 4 Wastewater Professional Operator Certificate, an Ohio Water Environment Association Class 4 Wastewater Analyst Certificate, and an OEA Industrial Pretreatment Inspector Certificate. Today, Jason will be presenting on the upgrades to the Lucas County uh, Water Resources Recovery Facility. And Jason, I believe those are fairly recent um, upgrades. Is that right? Uh, yeah, we're still actually in the process of completing those upgrades. All right, well, we're looking forward to hearing about it. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first off, I'm just going to start with a brief overview of our plant. Um, there we go. Um, we're operated by the Lucas County Commissioners, and we're located on River Road out between Waterville and Maumee. Uh, most of you are familiar, I'm sure, with uh, where we're at, sort of by Fallen Timbers Mall. So that's our location. to advance there we go uh, the flow coming into the plant uh, just as an overview our peak hydraulic capacity is almost 55 million gallons our design flow is 22 and a half million gallons and for 2019 our average flow was 17.26 um, million gallons just to give you an idea of our size uh, that flow comes from our service area, which includes the contract communities of Maumee, Sylvania, Waterville, White House. And then we also do Southern and Western Lucas County, including like Holland and out by the airport. And also a small portion of Wood County in Perrysburg Township um, from the Willow Bend lift station uh, actually comes underneath the river and discharges into our facility also. And our service is to about 110,000 customers. Uh, on the liquid treatment side for the water, uh, the wastewater coming in, um, we are actually two plants in one. The wastewater comes in our 90 inch sewer to our headworks, and then we split the water into two uh, uh, treatment streams, which are called the east and the west. Oddly enough, they're on the east side of the facility and the west side of the facility. Uh, as the water comes in and after it's split, we then do the fine screening of the water to remove uh, you know, visible trash, such as candy wrappers, two by fours, that kind of stuff. And we use six millimeter screen. Uh, from screening, we go to grit removal. Uh, on the east side of the plant, we use aerated grit removal. And on the west side, we have a vortex grit removal system. And the grit, obviously, being removed is sand, gravel, coffee grounds, eggshells, uh, that kind of uh, hard material. Uh, the screenings and the grit are then uh, collected and sent to the landfill for disposal. After, oops, sorry about that. There we go. Grit remove after grit removal, we do primary clarification on both sides. That's just primary settling, letting the heavy solid fall to the bottom. Uh, that sludge at the bottom of the tank, primary sludge, is then sent to our feedstock tank, which we'll see a little bit about here in a minute. Um, we use chemical precipitation for phosphorus removal. We currently use ferrous chloride for that. It binds with the phosphorus and precipitates it out and falls to the bottom of the tanks. Uh, we use conventional aeration. We have aeration tanks, which makes an activated sludge with the fine bubble diffuser. That takes that. 
from there, we use secondary clarification, the final settling tanks or secondary settling tanks, which are our final settling tanks, allows the mixed liquor coming off the activated sludge tank to settle out. The clear effluent then proceeds over the weirs and goes through ultraviolet disinfection. And the mixed liquor at the bottom of that then becomes either return activated sludge or waste activated sludge. And as I just mentioned, we use ultraviolet disinfection uh, to disinfect for E. coli, amongst other things. But we test for E. coli. Um, we have a 126 um, E. coli per 100 milliliter limit for our monthly limit. And our disinfection season is March 1st through November 30th. So it's a little bit longer, but we're right here where we're located. Uh, in the heart of the walleye fishing in the spring, and then we have a lot of kayakers and stuff in the summer and fall that pass right by the plant. The solids treatment, so the primary sludge that I mentioned earlier uh, goes through a thermal treatment system that we have just added. Uh, that is to get it to class A, we, we heat it for at 160 degrees Fahrenheit for at least 20 minutes to achieve what is considered you know, pasteurization at that point. Uh, from there, we do anaerobic di digestion. We're keeping our digesters between 95 and 100 degrees Fahrenheit in the mesophilic temperature range to maximize the methane we're producing. That methane then uh, will be burned in a cogeneration system to produce electricity for the plant. And it also, from there, after it's been digested, we dewater it using two centrifuges, or centresis centrifuges. Uh, those replace our belt filter press that we had. The dewatered uh, biosolids then are sent out for land application to farm fields. Um, this is a pretty busy slide. I understand that. This is just a an overview of our whole treatment system, starting up in the left corner. That's where our head works are for the east and west plant. And it's just a flow diagram showing you uh, the water going through the east and west plant, uh, the different primary aeration. Then back here at the end site is, you know, in the middle, there's a feedstock tank, which is new, a thermal treatment, which is new. The digesters aren't new, but they've been upgraded to accommodate the new treatment system. And then when the centrifuges are there, which go to our biosolid storage and for land app, and then there's our UV disinfection uh, unit. We have one on each side, and then the effluent is then combined back into one stream and goes to the river under one NPDES permit. And now we have poll question number one. All right, for your first poll, your question is, what chemical does the Lucas County WRRF add for phosphorus removal? Your options are alum, chloride, ferrous chloride, or potassium permanganate. While we're waiting for people to go through that poll, I'd like to ask you a question. So in that diagram, sure. you had one section that um, where odors were controlled. How exactly does that process work? Um, a little bit of the odors are controlled with the ferrous chloride. Um, we mainly add that for phosphorus removal, but it also does help with some of the hydrogen sulfide. But our main odor control is by using chemical odor scrubbers, uh, which take the air off of the incoming sewer and off uh, the weirs of the primary tanks. And we run that through um, three stage chemical scrubbers, which stage one is a sulfuric acid stage, stage two is a sodium hydroxide stage, and stage three is a sodium hypochlorite stage. And uh, the way those work are um, the chemical is showered down from the top through uh, a plastic media that looks like um, 
skeletal tennis balls. They're about that size and they're just plastic skeletons. And the air is forced up through those. And as the air contacts the chemical, it strips out the ammonia, the hydrogen sulfide, and, and the um, any odors that would be in the uh, incoming sewer gas type situation. All right, a few more seconds. We have about 91% of the people who voted. All right, looks like um, we have ferrous chloride as the majority vote, that's correct. Uh, at one time prior to 2006, 2005 or 2006, we did add alum. Uh, we switched to ferrous chloride at the time because it was free and the, the uh, steel plants were looking to get rid of it. And also with alum, we were creating uh, hydrogen sulfide in our, in our sludge. And with ferrous chloride, we have not had uh, a ferrous or a hydrogen sulfide problem. We're not adding that sulfate. So. All right, the anaerobic digestion upgrades that we're uh, completing here. Uh, we started with cleaning out and replacing the roof and mixers on all four digester tanks. Um, three of those roofs are fixed roof, and the fourth one is a membrane roof to uh, contain the methane gas that we're going to produce and are producing. Uh, we also replaced our boilers and generators with two new boilers and two new generators. We added a feedstock receiving for liquids and solids. So we can bring uh, material from outside the plant into the plant to uh, upgrade or boost our methane production. As a result, we added uh, thermal treatment to move to class A from class B. Um, we're looking at uh, opening doors to um, better usage of our biosolids at the end where we're not locked into just land application. So we while we were doing these upgrades, we went ahead and did the upgrades to get to Class A. We replaced our belt filter press, which has been running since I believe 1984, with uh, two new Centresis centrifuges. We added uh, covered storage for our biosolids in the form of a clear span building. Uh, for years, we went through all the trouble to dewater the biosolids so that they'd be ready for land application, and then we just placed them out on a drying bed which when it's hot and sunny, that's great for a drying bed, but when it's cold and snowy or raining, they're not really drying anything. It's just adding water back to what we just spent all the time and money to get rid of. So we're happy with our clear span, keeping the, the, the bio solids dry once we went through the process to dry them. Uh, we also had to add a gas conditioning skid in a system to condition the gas. So when it goes through the generators, it's clean and We'll continue to expand the life of the, the generators. And we also replaced our waste gas flare. Uh, this is a picture of our digester. You can see in the background, there's two of the three fixed roofs. They're um, pieced together with the triangles there. And then in front is digester number four with the inflatable membrane roof that um, has the methane gas underneath it, along with the fan propping it up to be a membrane. So when the gas is removed, you're still keeping pressure on it. And that is a mixing pump that we also replaced in all four digesters. All four digesters now have a Vaughn mixing pump where it takes the sludge in, pumps it back out through nozzles, inside the tank so you're getting a lot better mix in the past we had um what amounted to the propeller mixers just a long shaft going through the roof of the digester that would mix the tank um, they did a fairly good job but these we, we turned the tank around uh very quickly with all the nozzles going in there it keeps it from you know parfaying out into stratification of the supernate and the sludge at the bottom 
uh, we're really happy with these as far as how they keep the mixture and the sludge uh, consistent. Here's a picture of what our two new boilers look like. Um, these are a lot bigger than we had before because we're you know, heating the heat treatment system also. So these are two, we have two of these Power Master boilers that will, currently they're running under nat, off natural gas. They will eventually, once the gas conditioning skid is commissioned, uh, be running on methane instead of natural gas. So we're looking forward to that to save our natural gas bill. We also installed two Genbacher engines. Uh, these will be burning methane also to produce electricity for the plant. We're hoping to be, you know, at least 80% sufficient on our own and only bring in about 20% first energy or Toledo Edison. And the hope there is to save a lot of money on our electric bills. Uh, those are rated at a thousand kilowatts an hour each. And currently our plant uses between 1500 and 1600 kilowatts an hour. And here is poll question number two. All right, what size are each of the two Genbacher generators? Give you a couple minutes to vote. While we're waiting on that, I have another question for you. What is sure. your percent solids on the centrifuge cake? Uh, currently, we're running in the high 20s. Um, we can get it drier, but then we run into some discharge issues where it discharges out of the centrifuges and out into our clear span building. So we're not drying it to the maximum. We're, we're trying to run it in the high 20s. Um, it becomes an issue of, you know, we can add more polymer to get it drier, but then you have a polymer cost or or do you leave it a little wet and let it sort of air dry out there and then, you know, get that savings back on the dryness when you land apply it. So right now we're looking at the high 20s. All right, we have about 81% of our votes in. So please get those in within the next couple seconds. And a thousand kilowatts per hour is the correct answer. So if running them both at 100%, we would be at 2000 and we currently need between 1500 and 1600. So that allows us to meet our needs. And then when one generator goes down for service, we can still meet most of our needs and then supplement what extra electricity we need with Toledo Edison. Oops. Sorry about that touchy mouse. I don't know why it keeps going past that one slide. All right, finally. Uh, there's a picture of our feedstock tank. It's 230,000 gallons. Uh, it received um, feeding from our primary sedimentation tank. So our primary sludge ends up going to the feedstock tank where it mixes with um, our liquids receiving pit, anything that we receive in there, and our dry solids receiving hopper also goes into that feedstock tank and is mixed to make a slurry that would then go to the next step of heat treatment. We have three heat treatment tanks that are 3,000 gallons a piece. Uh, they're set up uh, through a SCADA system. So while one tank is heating to 160 for 20 minutes, 
a previous tank that has been already heated for that long is discharging, and then the third tank is filling. So they're always uh, they're running in sequence. Well, one's filling, one's emptying, and one's holding at 160. So that's how uh, we run the feedstock through those. And then from there, that sludge that's been heated then goes to the anaerobic digesters. And the anaerobic digesters, we produce the methane off there, we'll burn that. And then those digesters one, two, and three, which are fed by those thermal treatment, overflow into digester four, which had the membrane roof. The sludge in digester four is then pumped back over to the dewatering building where we have these two centresis centrifuges that we spoke of. Uh, behind the wall where the crane is hanging down, we have a 6,000 gallon polymer tank that feeds the centrifuges. Uh, we're currently running both centrifuges at the same time at about 70 gallons per minute. And we run those about five days a week right now. Uh, we have the capability of, while well, one's down for maintenance, speeding up uh, the one centrifuge and just running one at a higher speed and then maybe even extending, um, you know, the week to run it for seven days a week if we had to, well, we're down to one. That's how we're dewatering. The dewatered sludge then comes off the centrifuges and is pumped through the wall, out into the clear span, through the chute, and then it is placed on the pad. Uh, the way we manage that is with the front end loader then, where the sludge drops at those ports onto the ground, we bring a front loader in, scoop it up, and then stack it uh, you know, at the far end of the building and work our way back. And then as you can see, the sludge becomes relatively dry. You can see a crust forming, uh, the white chalkiness, is just where it comes, you know, in contact with the air and dries out even more than we had it coming out of the pile right by the brick wall there. Um, you know, that's that's where you're looking at the high 20s right there, and then um, you know, your dryer depending on the weather, even you know, humidity and everything further along there. This is our gas conditioning skid, so the methane that comes off. Uh, of the digestion system. We'll go through this gas conditioning skid before it runs through the boilers and the generators. Uh, we use the chiller, the large air conditioner there. We'll chill it. That'll get rid of some of the moisture. And then we also run it through carbon tanks. And that will get rid of, um, if there's any hydrogen sulfide in there, that'll get removed by the system. Siloxanes will get removed by the system. Uh, this is not commissioned yet, so, um, we haven't seen any, uh, you know, percent reductions or anything like that yet. Uh, but this is where the gas will get cleaned up to go through the engines and the boilers. Uh, that is our waste gas flare, our new waste gas flare in the foreground, the black tube. Uh, any methane that, well, currently we're using it because we're not burning the methane in the generators or the boilers at this time, so we're flaring it off. In the future. You know, our goal would be not to run this very often because we'll be consuming all of our methane we produce in the generators to produce electricity and the boilers to produce heat to run the system. In the background there, you can also see our feedstock tank from a different angle with the gas conditioning skids in front of it. Uh, the building right behind the flare with the white garage door, that would be our solids receiving station. Uh, so if we receive the dry material in the future, such as dewatered biosolids or, uh, you know, food waste from a stadium or a cafeteria, uh, there's a hopper in there where the truck would dump into the hopper and then a grinder pump would grind it into a slurry and send that to the feedstock tank. Uh, in the driveway right in front of that, that's where our 12,000 gallon liquid receiving is. So the tanker truck just backed into uh, that area and there's a um, fixture that they can hook their hose up to and discharge liquids into the into the ground into our receiving station and then that is pumped into the feedstock tank also and mixed with like I said our primary sludge to go through thermal treatment. Uh, currently 
we're not we haven't received any dry solids yet we're still trying to get this up and running uh, we've received some liquid waste including uh, grease trap waste from restaurants uh, through some septic haulers that way and also some um, industrial waste from um, a client down in Lima that's a, a byproduct that's a watered down um, chemical waste so the future you know we can accept uh, food stock waste from uh, different places like stadiums I know uh, like in Cleveland they, they collect all this the food waste from like the Indian games and the Brown games and then send that to a digester they have separate bins for that in this inside the stadium so you know that could be a source of food for the methane production and then also even like biosolids from other smaller plants can come here and we could get the energy out of that the building with the white truck in front of it that's the office that runs uh that has the SCADA system to run the thermal treatment and the dewatering and then the centrifuges are at the far end of that that's cut off at that picture And now we have poll question number three. All right, how does your facility manage biosolids? So select all that apply. Land application, co-generation, landfill, other, or my facility does not have responsibility for biosolids. I've got a question going off of what we were just talking about with the feedstock tank. So when you're getting in these uh, different types of waste, like the food waste, so that's mainly just to help with methane production. So kind of the idea with that is to get in those to be able to help with offsetting energy costs. Correct. Uh, it, it's twofold. Our main our main goal was to bring that in because it's it's full of energy um, and we can break that down in the digester and then produce a lot of methane off of it. It also keeps it out of the landfill, which saves space there, which the landfills are happy about and landfilling is expensive. So we would be a cheaper alternative to landfilling that material, but then we also get the energy production. Um, you know, it, it's a food, that's why, that's why we eat it because we get energy off it. Well, once it goes into the digester, the bacteria you see that as a great food source too, and uh, produce a lot of methane using it. Are you charging to have those? You know, so if you've had a stadium dropping off food waste, would you charge that stadium for that the ability for them to drop it off? Yes, there would be a tipping fee that would be negotiated uh, between the client and. Uh, us as far as uh, how much we're going to charge them per truckload just as a handling fee. And currently we're running that through our uh, contractor, which is uh, our design builder, which is Quasar Energy. Uh, they're handling the food um, feedstock receiving and um, securing the feedstock um, clients at this time as they get it up and running and prove that the system can work that way um you know they're responsible for the food coming in so that you know they can make sure the system that they are building us works all right we're going to go ahead and close the poll here in a few seconds All right. Um, currently, we we land apply our biosolids. Bio um, usually, we get uh, about three times a year. There's a window in the spring. We get some out in the summer. As soon as uh, winter wheat comes down, we get some more biosolids out to land application. And our big land application um, time is the fall when corn and soybeans come down. Uh, is when we get rid of the majority of our uh, biosolids through land application. Uh, once we're completely up and running 
and you know convert over to class a officially our hope is to get away from land application uh just throwing it out on a farm field i know it's not really just throwing it out there there's rules you know the 503 rules are under uh where you know we apply those but uh our goal is to work with um, some composters or another um, source of removing the biosolids in a more timely fashion quicker from our plant and getting a more beneficial use out through composting and soil management that way with uh, land application um, always being at the mercy of the weather. Uh, some years are good, some years are bad for land application. So we're looking at that in the future. Uh, the cogeneration answer, um, we do cogenerate with the sludge uh, before it is dewatered into the biosolids that we land apply. So that is partly correct. Uh, landfill, we do have the option to landfill, but landfilling is very expensive. So only in extreme cases when we're completely full on our storage pads have we landfilled biosolids. Um, so that is a, uh, last resort, but we do have the ability to do that. And I see other and my facility doesn't have the responsibility. So wide variety of ways that biosolids can be managed. All right, now I'll open it to any questions uh, that you have. There's my contact information with my email at the bottom if uh, anybody thinks of a question or has any further information they want in the future, feel free to email me. Great, thank you, Jason. Uh, that was fascinating. Um, it looks like a, obviously a huge investment on the part of Lucas County. Um, do, you, do you have some, some numbers as far as that investment and um, what is the period of time that you think it'll take to recoup that um, investment either through um, you know, the tipping fees and the energy savings? Um, currently, we're looking at around 19 million to do the whole thing. Um, throughout the project, there have been some change orders that have come up, um, both on our part that, hey, while we're doing this project, we need to add this. And then there's been some other things that we've added through um, the design builder that have um, ramped up the price a little bit. But currently we're around 19 million. Uh, we're looking at under 10 years to repay it, and then based on the tipping fees, um, the tipping fees really aren't a big deal to us. That's not why we're in this. We're more in this for the energy savings, and then having a, a biosolid at the end that's a better product that more people want, and we're looking at the savings um, there too. The tipping fees for us are just a little bonus. Um, currently, our electric bills are anywhere between 900 and a million dollars a year. So if we can, you know, get rid of 80% of that, there's a savings. Biosolids, um, you know, depending on the year, if we can get everything out based on the weather, we're spending 350 thousand dollars roughly to get rid of biosolids. So if we find somebody that wants our Class A product, we don't have that that expense. There's a savings there. So then with the tipping fees coming in too, and you know, other savings throughout the the process, our, our hope is to pay it off with in under 10 years. It sounds like a great sustainable solution for, for the ratepayers. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Matt. I've seen a lot of questions come in, so we've got um, about 10 minutes here to get through some of those. So I'll hand it over to you, Matt. Thanks. So one of the things I wanted to start with was asking kind of what got the ball rolling with this whole project? So I know sometimes it can take a long time, even if your facility needs upgrades to actually get that process started. So what was kind of the way in which it got started and how you were able to actually get traction to get these changes done? um we we began um some cogeneration back in the mid 90s we had two uh 480 uh 
caterpillars that we were burning, the methane that we were producing just using our own, you know, primary sludge. And those those generators would produce enough electricity to run the digestion process as far as the mixers and the heaters and that. And it would also run one of our pumps in the West plant that came on in 2005. Uh, so looking at that, we did have a history of cogeneration and we knew there was more more of an outlet there to maximize um, what can be uh, generated as far as methane and turn into electricity. Um, as uh, just time has gone by, you know, landfilling space is at a premium and it's expensive. So there's, you know, food food processors and people like that are reaching out for a cheaper way to dispose of their food waste which then, you know, we can turn into energy. So it's a win-win there. Um, so we just looked at, okay, we're doing this already. Um, what's the best way we can maximize this and, you know, just do what we're doing, but ramp it up. And at the same time, then we added the uh, class A process of heating the sludge up to pasteurize it so that we could have uh, more outlets at the end for the class A product. But just as um, you know, the green movement, so to speak, is you know more and more people are into separating out waste, keeping things out of landfills, and that you know sort of fed into the hey, there's a really a market for this as far as being able to take this in and find sources for the food. And when do you expect the rest of these upgrades to be completed? Uh, I don't have a end date yet. We're we're moving along um, piece by piece here. The generators and boilers, while well, the boilers are installed and running on natural gas, the generators are installed. We're working with First Energy right now on an interconnection agreement um, as far as the testing goes to prove, uh, you know, that we're not going to backfeed their system and cause any trouble to Toledo Edison. So we're hoping. Um, the sooner the better, but I would say we're in June now, hopefully by the end of the year, just to get all the bugs up, up. You know, once we get up and running, there'll be some issues that come up with the generators, and, and that's just the nature of the beast when you're trying to start those. But currently, we're, we're using the heating with the boilers. The digesters are up and running. The centrifuges are up and running. So... The last big hurdle is just getting those generators um, fired up and you know running the methane through the conditioning skid. So um, I'm hoping by the end of the year. Well, that sounds great. Another question: Does Lucas or do Lucas County employees do the land application, or do you hire a firm to apply the biosolids? We subcontract that. Um, we we dewater it here ourselves and place it on the uh, the pads. And then we have, currently we're under a contract with Cinegro. Uh, Cinegro goes out or whoever else we've had in the past um, goes out, meets with the farmers and secures the field, and gets those approved by the EPA, does the phosphorus testing. And then they come in once the farmers contact them and say, hey, we're ready for it. Uh, they come in, load it up in truck, haul it out to the field and land apply it. So we do not do our own land application. Going back to specific plant operation, when you increased, was this kind of an increase in what you'd need to do? So, you know, did you have to get new personnel or what's kind of the personal breakdown at your facility? Uh, yes, we um, did add uh, a few people. We added um, an operator and a maintenance person. So uh, the breakdown at our facility is we have nine operators that are 24-7. Um, we run 24-7 here. So on, well, when it's a non-COVID schedule uh, under normal conditions, we have three operators per shift, Monday through Wednesday, two operators per shift on Thursday and Friday. And then on the weekend, there's one operator here at all times. So 
Uh, we're 24-7, like I said, man 24-7. Uh, maintenance staff, we have a maintenance coordinator. And then under him, we have six maintenance specialists. They perform uh, you know, the maintenance duties as far as working on pumps, cutting grass, painting, uh, you know, general maintenance there. We also have two chemists in our lab and a pretreatment coordinator that takes care of uh, not only pretreatment, but she's also the biosolids coordinator. And then we have a um, clerical specialist that, uh, and an electrician. So most of us are Monday through Friday on day shift, but then, um, you know, maintenance people are on call if something goes wrong and operators are always here to, to run the plant. But yeah, with the new the new system out there, uh, we added an extra operator uh, just a year ago, knowing this was coming, so that they would be here for the training as the system came up and running, and it, it, so they wouldn't just be thrown into it. So we were ahead of the curve in that in that uh, instance. Once these upgrades are complete, can you see yourself or your facility wanting to do any additional ones? Or is this kind of something where this was the main need that you saw for your facility? Uh, I think at this point, once we get this up and running, uh, we'll be in a good spot. Um, you know, we'll hopefully be at least 80% energy neutral. Uh, as far as expanding, um, and adding digesters or something like that, I, I don't see that happening. Uh, we're sort of landlocked here where we are as far as space goes. So to add extra digesters and eventually, you know, if flows go up, we'll have to expand the west plant uh, for the liquid stream as, as our flows go up. So that'll take some of the available space that's currently on site. It's already been designated for an additional primary tank, additional aeration tank. So um, as of now, we're not looking at expanding into where we could sell electricity back or to you know, be a methane production center for cars or anything like that. Uh, we just don't have the space or the, the facility here, uh, the area to put it. And going back to kind of the funding associated with these upgrades, were there any outside grant fundings utilized for the improvements or is this all just based on kind of the internal return on investment? Uh, we we received loans from the OWPC and the OWDA. And then uh, a lot of it is, um, you know, funded by the county with the payback uh, being shared with the contract communities. Uh, Back on our contract or service area page, uh, Maumee, Waterville, White House, Sylvania, uh, our contract communities, they, they share in our O&M bill as far as the expenses go. We um, quarterly would, will sell, send them an invoice based on the amount of flow they contribute to our plant and based on their agreements that they signed with Lucas County, they're also responsible for a percentage of our O&M costs and upgrades. So uh, they're a partner in this as well. Um, you know, we're, we're the plant here that's regional and accept that, but they, they are also partners in this and they were, um, you know, a part of the decision to, to go ahead with this, knowing that they would be uh, also funding it. And then I have a question related to of the actual process where you know you put in is a kind of that pasteurization type where you're heating up the material does that then before you know, there's any discharge associated with that does the water have time to eventually cool off or is it something where are there differences in temperature going into the river versus the air temperature or just ambient temperatures at the time uh well the, the water itself um is it going through the, the heat treatment? Uh, the water itself is on a separate stream and avoids the, uh, the solids and the pasteurization. So the water temperature going to the river is pretty much ambient of what's coming in uh, to the plant. 
um, the, the, the bio or the, the feedstock and the sludge that go through the thermal tanks are heated up to 160 degrees and held for 20 minutes. That, that sludge that comes out is discharged from the thermal tanks it actually does go through a cooling loop that knocks it down to between 120 and 140 degrees. So that when it feeds digesters one, two, and three, it's not quite a, a heat shock to that system. And that also helps keep the temperatures up around uh, 95 to 100 degrees for the anaerobic digestion system. So we do knock it down a little bit from the 160 to go into the into the digesters, um, if that answers your question. Um, but yeah, the water itself going to the river is, um, Pretty much ambient temperature around you know 60 to 70 degrees pretty much year round. All right, and Matt, we have time for one more question. Um, do we have a few other questions in the queue that we'll need to follow up on through email? No, that was pretty much the end of all the questions I had. Um, I guess one question would be, you know, because I guess I'm curious in terms of the temperatures coming out and how they can affect, you know, you're right by where people really like to do their walleye fishing, especially when the river is a little bit colder in the year, would it have impacts, you know, coming out that 60 to 7 degree mark, even kind of in winter or early spring? Um, as far as impact, yeah, in the middle of winter, uh, you know, our outfall is, is open down there for the most part, unless it's a real cold freeze or we have an ice jam like we've had in the past. But under normal winter conditions, when the river is frozen, there is a little channel that's created by our outflow or, or our outflowing out, outlet there. And what we've noticed is when you look over at our outfall, there's usually ducks and uh, birds sitting in that, you know, sitting on the ice next to that, and, and they enjoy it. Um, our flow into the river um, is, I don't want to say minimal especially when it's dry out. Uh, you, you've seen this river as far as uh, how temperamental it is to rain where it's up at you know 11 feet in Waterville and then you've been able to walk across it without getting your knees knees wet down here. So uh, as far as the temperature actually affecting the river other than you know a little pool and a little trickle right at our uh, discharge point, no it doesn't really affect the, the river or the the ecology of the whole river at all. All right, well, Jason, thank you for uh, the the details and answering all of those questions. Um, it was a great presentation, and I'm I'm sure that you'll have some follow up questions from folks as well. Um, and I want to I want to thank both Jason and Elizabeth for their presentations today and uh, taking the time to uh, put this together and to answer your questions. Uh, before we wrap up, I do have a few notes that I would like to cover. Um, before this email about 9:30, I'm sorry, before this webinar about 9:30 this morning, um, I sent out an email with a contact hours request form. Um, if you did not receive that, it's also attached to this webinar as a handout. Um, but we are asking that you uh, go ahead and fill out this form if you are requesting contact hours and email it back to us by midnight tonight. Um, from there, Team ACOG will provide the contact hours to all attendees who met the minimum requirements uh, for the participation, and we'll notify you of the contact hours via email, and we'll also email you a certificate of attendance. Um, from there, we will up upload all of the qualified attendees to the Ohio EPA website within 30 days. So that's about the time frame that you should see those up there. Um, I'd also like to remind you to take the mandatory survey following this webinar. Um, let us know what we did well today and what we could do better next time. Um, also, um, within that survey, please feel free to let us know if there are other topics that you would like to see us cover um, to allow us to provide more operator uh, contact hours for all of you. Um, so finally, I'd like to thank again uh, Jones & Henry Engineers for sponsoring this event. Uh, we couldn't have done this without you, so uh, thank you to Jones and Henry. And thanks to all of you for attending. And with that, we are signing off. <laughs>